Well, now we want to bring up the skipper and some of his coaching staff. Not all of the new coaches are here, but uh, most are. So let's welcome back to the stage the new skipper of the Baltimore Orioles, Brandon Hyde. The new first base coach is here, Arnie Baylor. The O's new pitching coach is here, Doug Brokell, former big league pitcher. Major League Field Coordinator and Catching Instructor. Welcome to Baltimore, Tim Cousins. The O's new hitting coach is here. Welcome to Baltimore to Don Long. The O's new bullpen coach and one-time Oriole player. Welcome back, John Wasden. And the Orioles assistant hitting coach who was on the staff the last couple of years. Welcome back, Howie Clark. Welcome, gentlemen. It's good to have you here. Good to meet you all. Uh, Brandon, uh, this was a task. You were hired late in December, and you, you had to put together. You put together a very good coaching staff, by the way. What went into how you decided who you wanted to go after and, and maybe the relationships that you had with these guys that brought them to you? Yeah, I feel, I feel really fortunate, obviously, about the staff that we put together. It was, um, yeah, very challenging and uh, Christmas time early January to be putting together a coaching staff and, and man, I just feel so fortunate the guys that we got um, some of them have had past relationships with others were um, guys that I've admired across the field or, or guys that were highly recommended from people that I that I trust um, and after talking on the phone with all these guys and meeting with some of them um, I think feel like they felt they shared the same vision I did in, in that uh, player development guys uh, player first, egoless guys that want to grind it out, and guys that just want to get players better. And um, I feel great about the group that is sitting here today, as long as with a couple others that aren't here. Now, one thing I did notice when the announcement was made: there, there isn't one of the coaches listed as bench coach. Now, Tim doesn't have a position except for catching instructor. So, can I assume that he'll be sitting next to you most games? Yeah, Tim's going to be, um, you know big part of the, the decision making process um the game planning um he's going to be he's you know, the best catching guy in the game so i feel obviously really fo i've known tim since we were i don't know teenage i don't know college-ish age um so 20 <laughs> a, plus a while back 20 plus years <laughs> um best catching guy in the game and he's going to be you know with me um and, and handling a lot of the of those type of duties that I've done um, for the last four or five years, when it's coordinating spring training, um, pre-game work, um, obviously the catching, and, this will, and a lot of the game decision-making stuff. Tim, let me ask you about that, because uh, you do have young catchers. Austin Wins made his big league debut last year. Chan Sisko is one of the top prospects. He was back and forth last year. Uh, how do you go about first learning these guys, and how do you help them get to the next level? I think just watching video and getting caught up uh, with what they can do physically. And then, of course, the, the most important component is establishing a relationship with the player and not diving in in the middle, starting at the beginning and going slow and, and finding what makes these players go. And I think once you do that, it's a fairly quick process to get to their deficiencies. All right, now this is for you. Let's see where the mics are. Well, hi, Brandon. And a uh, question was for you and also um, when Mike was up there, about your um, interest in using analytics. Um, the past management almost seemed defiant and not wanting to, like Chris Davis batting first, um, Mark Trumbo in right field, and was curious how you guys plan to use analytics to get the best uh, team out in the field. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I came from a, a heavy analytics um, progressive organization and saw how beneficial it is and, and you know, the team I came from was at a huge, big analytic department, and, and those guys were, you know, a part of our coaching staff and guys that we dealt with every single, not dealt with, worked with every single day. And I think Joe did a great job there of really welcoming it, and it caused a culture there where there was, it was open-minded and um, a lot of, you know, free thinking and, and being able to be creative and working on, um, whatever it may be. The bottom line with analytics is that you know, if it's going to help us win, if it's going to help the player out, um, I'm all for it. I want as much information as I possibly can get. And I know SIG's right now working on building um, the analytics team, um, building the models. Um, those guys came from Houston where obviously that's a big analytics organization as well, and SIG was a huge part of that. So to be able to have that growth coming here, um, we're really excited about 
You know, that, that is a, a really good question. And, Doug, I, I'm interested, the analytics on the pitching side, obviously pitchers have repertoires and, and they have strengths and they have weaknesses. Uh, how will you integrate whatever is presented to you information-wise to hopefully help your pitchers? Well, like Skip said, you know, these guys came from Houston. I was in the organization in Houston when, when we started that. The thing was, was for us, the old school guys started getting proved wrong. So watching it come to the forefront and being able to utilize the information wasn't just for us. It was to eliminate pitches that doesn't work for a guy, you know, making his, his repertoire a lot, a lot better for himself and the attack of the, of the game plan. Um, I think what it does is it allows the catching guys to catch up quicker. That way we can take a pitch away and say, hey, listen, just don't even utilize it. It's, it's, it's a poor pitch. It gets hit hard. So that's where we're going to attack it. And a lot of people don't understand that when you, when you talk analytics, a lot of the stuff doesn't go to the player. It goes to the coaching staff, and then we have to sit down and, hey, this guy's struggling with this pitch. What do you think? What are your guys telling you behind the dish? That way we can – we can get the guy to trust it from afar instead of just throwing a lot of numbers at him because guys don't guys don't really care about the numbers they care about if their stuff is good and if they're going out every night on a daily basis trying to help us win a ball game so we're going to eliminate a lot of stuff we're probably not going to add a lot of stuff but what it does is it gives us the opportunity to say hey listen your three pitches are good enough Let's not be jack all trade master or none. Let's work on these three pat pitches, master it, and and win a ball game. Don, is that the same with hitters? You know, you, you get information uh, maybe on an opposing pitcher, his tendencies. Are those the type of things you'll be relaying to your hitters? Well, I think in part, but I think a lot of it from the hitting side where we're at a little bit of a disadvantage is we don't have the ball. Right. So we have to be offensive. Um, we can't walk up to home plate with the ball in our hand and, scan the field and hit it where they where they're not but uh you know we really i've really used it to look at uh as a, as an objective way to really show hitters what they're good at and try and get them to stick to what they're good at show them where they're challenged where they're having some trouble and you know if they're open-minded and they're curious about it and they're willing to be open to it i think they're gonna they're gonna find out what's possible you know, I think that's really, really important. Um, a hitter has a certain level of confidence he takes to the plate. And as he continues to learn and grow and improve, um, I think he opens himself up to, to getting even better. But we always want to work off of what they're good at. Howie, you're returning. You know all the players on this team. How influential will it be for you and Don before you get the spring training to bring him up to speed on what you've seen over the past couple of years because you've been there. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a big deal. And uh, Don and I have talked a couple of times. And uh, there's, it, there's a lot of learning to be done. Mm -hmm. But baseball is baseball, you know. And uh, <laughs> with, with video and all this stuff that we can go and pull up video from last year or previous years and um, just – it's one of those things that takes a little time, but as Don said, you know, it's it's one of the, it's exciting, and I think getting these players to know what they're good at and how to uh, get them to express it all the time. I mean, it's it's we're gonna have a good relationship, and uh, we'll hash it out. So that's what spring training's for, and, right. and heading forward, it's, it's it's gonna be a lot of fun. Hey, over here by Jackie. Yes. In contrast to the previous administration, do you intend to use small ball tactics, bunting, stealing bases, playing hit and run, instead of just waiting for three run homers all the time? What do you, what do you want to do? A mix of all of that. Yeah, I mean, I, that sounds good to me. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that you um, try to win the game, you know, and, and uh, you're going to utilize whatever... It's also personnel driven too. So if you have a young, athletic, uh, fast team that can be able to steal bases and do certain things, you're going to probably be more aggressive on the bases. If you're a team that's um, a bunch of sluggers down through the lineup, then you're probably going to be a little bit more conservative and let way for the homer. Um, so I think that your, the makeup of your ball club is really going to determine on how, on how you play. And, you know, I think. 
the bottom line is putting yourself in position to, to win the game the best way you can. And if that means bunting your runner over to third base with nobody out in the eighth inning, then that's, then that's the way. Um, but I think you have to really, there's no one set way of determining, this is, this, is my, this is my philosophy. It's about personnel I have and making a real smart decision on, on what the right thing to do is at the right time and try to win the game. You know, the most important spot in the lineup might be the number two spot, because if Cedric Mullins leads off and he's on base, does Jonathan VR bat second because you know he'll take a pitch <laughs> because Cedric might want to steal? I mean, what, what goes into yeah. where you place guys in the lineup? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, you, when you look at your lineup construction, obviously you want your like, the highest on base guy at, um, at, the, at the top. Um, and bottom line is I want my best three hitters hitting the top three spots. I want to get as many at bats over the course of of the year as we possibly can. So um, the guys that and it, kind of work it down from there. Um, but I want my best hitters to hitting as much as possible. Um, and the highest on base guys, hopefully a little bit above them, so to, to create runs. So yeah, that's something we're going to be looking at in spring training. Um, probably play with a lot of different lineups, shuffle guys around different spots, kind of see how it looks, see how it feels, um, and then make adjustments as the, as the year goes. Adam, uh, way over there. Hi. Uh, yeah, my wife and I have been uh, season ticket owners since uh, the, the new stadium was uh, created and um, really excited about this new season with this new crop and a lot of energy here. So my questions are for um, uh, Doug and Don. Uh, Doug, with your background in Houston, do you think you can bring some of the expertise that turned Justin Verlander around there so successfully and bring that to some of the pitchers here? And uh, for Don, on the hitting side, are you going to be looking at getting players to hit uh, opposite field more to beat the shifts? Because that's obviously uh, tough, on, especially our lefty hitters. A lot of them hitting at those shifts, and uh, you know, they're willing to give up a lot to hit home runs. But we'd like to see more base hits, I think. So <laughs> love to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Well, I, I think you, a good hitter or a complete hitter is able to, to take what is given to him. Um, and, you know, spending the last five years with a guy like Joey Votto is probably the best example I can give you where there would be times, depending on who he's facing, the situation of the game, you know, he's looking to do uh, damage in certain counts. But there's also a lot of times, depending on how he's feeling and who he's facing, where his whole plan going into the game is to try and hit four line drives over the shortstop's head. So, I, you know, the complete hitter would be able to do both. And I, I think the, the one dimensional hitter uh, is the guy who's more, more vulnerable to, to the shifting. So I think, you know, hitting the ball the other way is certainly important. Uh, gives you a lot more options. Um, but I have to get to a spot where I actually am working with these guys to see what they're capable of right now and then start to incorporate things like that in, into, into what we do. As far as the pitching goes, with, with Verlander, I was in Texas. So, I don't, you know, I know what they did. You know, it, it doesn't take a genius to, to look at, at how they went about their business. Uh, I know that that analytics team over there is one of the best in, the, in, in baseball. Now that we have the genius on our side, I know, I know what we're going to get out of the, the analytics here. Um, the one thing that, that I want is consistency. You know, the, the game of baseball fluctuates up and down so much. If we, can, if we can get our guys, especially our starters, to go out 30, 32 starts, whatever they're going to make, and just be consistent in their work and be consistent with their attack, it gives us that chance to take away the emotion. You know, a lot of times... A lot of times you'll say, oh, well, why is he doing that? Well, it's, it's either he can't or it's, it's emotional-led. I want, I want the emotion taken out of it. That way that these guys can stay on an even playing field, go out, attack, do the same work, bust their hump. Um, I know with this coaching staff, we're not going to have a problem with work. So, you know, we're going to get our guys out. We're going to get them out there on the field. We're going to bust our rear ends. We're going to find out what they're good at. And we are going to attack that until they're tired of attacking it. And that's what leads to success. Jackie, over here. 
what I'd like to ask Brandon and Don is, uh, for me, the most frustrating part of the season last year was a sort of a season-long soap opera of getting uh, Chris Davis going. And there didn't seem to be any accountability as far as we never saw a bunt, we never saw a fungo ground ball to third or short. And uh, it just seemed like because he had a high contract, he automatically was going to stay on the 25-man roster the whole season. And uh, I just wanted to know if going here into spring training, is there going to be any sense that whether it's spring training, the first 50 games, the all-star break, that, you know, there's, there'll be some accountability. We have to see something. Uh, it's not just privilege. Well, with, with Chris, obviously I wasn't here last year, so I didn't see. But I think I said on the radio the other day, you, you just don't have those years um, that he had if it's not in there. And... Our job, you know, I've tried to create a relationship with Chris before, um, before spring training. So I've, I've talked to him on the phone a couple times. I want to get to know him as a, as a person. It's a clean slate with me. I know it's a clean slate with Don. Um, but my first, before I start, we start coaching him up or talking to him about making adjustments is to get to know him as a guy. Um, and that's what spring training's for. And that's what I tried to do as much as I could before spring training was to get to know him as a person, talk to a lot of people that know him. Um, he's a great guy. And so I'm trying to just get to know him first. And then as we go into spring training, uh, then we make adjustments a as we see him. But if you just pile on a player before there's a relationship there, not going to work. Um, so that's kind of been our objective going in. And then it's a clean slate, and, and we evaluate and see how it goes. And this, we're in a competitive deal, so we're fully aware. This is, uh, this is about winning ball games. We're going to do everything we can to do that. Um, so with that being said, you know, we're going to go in with, with our best guys. Um, and hopefully Chris, and I know he will be one of those guys. Don, you want to comment? You threw a real softball up there for us. <laughs> nice. Uh, you know, I just met him last night. I met he and his wife last night, and actually we had a nice brief conversation and talking about how he and his wife had a couple days away from a, a three-year-old and, and one-year-old twins and how they were excited to get some sleep. So <laughs> that's where the conversation starts, and I agree with Brandon. I mean, you, you know, these guys, um, not Chris specifically, but anybody playing at this level, they're under a lot of scrutiny, obviously, uh, which is what they sign up for, and they understand that. And I believe a big part of our job and my job is to create an environment where, you know, they are able to continue to, to learn and to grow and to present the best version of themselves as often as they can. And I think the only way to start that process is to, you know, seek something from them first, find out what their perspective is and get to know them and then and then create that relationship and a trust where then you're side by side working together and everything's on the table for all these guys but until you do that and if you try and uh, short circuit that process they there won't be trust and, and you won't make the gains that you eventually could you know and I, I will tell you for whatever it's worth last night at the sponsor event most of the 40-man roster is here, some of the top minor league prospects. And my memory, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I, I thought Chris Davis got the biggest ovation when he was introduced. So for whatever it's worth, uh, he is still loved here in Baltimore. Adam, right there in the back. Um, one, I'd like to congratulate and welcome all of you to the Baltimore Orioles. I think it's great that we have an opportunity to meet the coaching staff two weeks prior to spring training and the, and the pitchers and catchers reporting. The second issue is um, the shift itself. When a player is up to bat, you hear people in the audience, you know, the fans say, well, why don't they just learn to bunt or hit it to the other side of the field? How difficult is it for a player that is at bat to accomplish something like that? Because you're playing analytics, obviously. The shift is on. Obviously, what, 90% or more, they're going to hit it to that side of the field. What's your opinion on that? It's a question that has um, 
been, you know, asked at every one of these for the last five years I've been a part of fan fests um, is why don't players hit to the other side of the field when, when they're shifted? It's because it's not that easy. That's the bottom line. Um, pitchers are attacking in a certain way. Pitchers are attacking into, into the shift. Guys got to the big leagues because they could do certain things. And to be automatically be able to um, let the ball travel a little further, get on top more, and hit a fungo the other way, it's, it's way, it's a lot harder than it looks. Um, you know, there's, so there's certain situations where there are guys that work on it, there's certain guys that don't work on it, um, there's certain guys that bunt, um, they, they have to take away from. Um, we had a couple guys in Chicago that worked hard on, on, their, on their bunting because they were getting shifted to the pole side, and, and it was a weapon for them. So those are the, you know, those are the thing, ways to combat it, but the, the bottom line is it's just not that easy to beat the shift the other way if guys are running balls in on you and, and making you hit to the pole side as well. And guys that kind of are who they are when they get here, um, and it's hard to change. I'm pretty old and old-fashioned. I've been a baseball fan since I was uh, eight years old, the summer of 47, which was Jackie's rookie year. Um, I grew up in South Jersey and um, moved to Baltimore 40 years ago and converted to becoming an Orioles fan. Brandon, I grew up a Cubs fan in my, for a long time, back to the Ernie Banks era. Uh, I'm old-fashioned and... Uh, since you guys came to town and, and, and everything else, and you've used it several times today, talking about analytics, please give me a definition, explain what it is. I think it's a variation of analysis, probably involves a computer or something like that, which I don't know that probably. much about either, because the best computer is the human brain. And um, so explain exactly what you mean by analytics. Great question. Super broad, right? It's a real broad term, and that it's just a, a, it's a tool to help in a teaching moment, how you defend, how you pitch, what your deficiencies are offensively or, or defensively, but it's, it's an extra tool of help that you're getting information. It's just information that you're receiving to help, and the best teams or the teams that have coaches have the best relationship with the players that they can give them the right information, and that's, the, that's all it is. It's just information coming to help you, your team, and an individual player have success. Arnie, as the first base coach, do, do analytics come in play for you? Uh, I know you'll have the stopwatch, your timing, the moves to first and all that, but how do all the numbers and all this information help you with the base runners when they get to first base? Yeah, uh, I thought I was going to sneak out of this without getting to talk. <laughs> Man. I, I try to include you all. I appreciate that. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's it's really developed the uh, you know basically the percentages and uh, they can get down to talk about secondary leads and primary leads and and really put lines on these guys uh, from that standpoint to to help out and again just added information that you know you can sit and look at these guys and you can see whether somebody gets a good secondary lead or somebody gets a good jump but. With all these numbers involved now, you can you can have a piece of paper. Again, it's a teaching tool or as a backup tool to just be able to show the players. And when you can come in and talk to a, a guy about getting a better secondary lead uh, and say, hey, look, here's the averages. Here's what you used to do. Here's what you're doing now. Uh, that helps. And it just helps back up what you're trying to teach and what you're trying to say and and it it's effective in all phases of what we're doing right now so it's it, it is a big help and and with the pitchers throwing over in certain counts uh throwing breaking balls in certain counts just the percentages of that to reinforce something to give us an opportunity to maybe take advantage here and there uh of 90 feet somewhere to help out that that helps also so those are that's the information stuff that we're getting. It's not that, you know, it's a backup. And a lot of people have thrown the numbers around and have done on-base percentages and formulas to put a lineup together for years and years, just like he was talking about. Uh, you know, certain coaches and managers have done that for a long time. But with all these, uh, the, the information we're getting is more and more every day. And uh, it, it's, you're crazy if you're not taking advantage of it to help teach the guys in for us to use in situations also. Now, uh, John, I'd be interested as the bullpen coach because, uh, you know, I know uh, the manager's line for relievers is your role is when 
the phone rings and I tell you to come in the game, go get a, a hitter out. But, but there are certain relievers that will be in certain spots. Will you be bringing the analytics out there to help prepare the reliever for what he might get in the game, the part of the lineup he'll face and things like that? I mean, you, you are a major league pitcher, so you certainly know what it takes to get guys out. Oh, without a doubt. Um, again, being in the bullpen, it's an extension of the pitching coach, extension of the manager. But what we'll do is maximize the potential of those pitchers who are in any given night or are going to be in any different, any kind of situation. So the analytics is just giving them the best possible information to have success on that given moment, that given out, that given pitch, that given at bat throughout the course of a season. So it could change day to day. But yes, the, the analytics will allow, I'll have it down there, but when that pitcher gets up there on the rubber after I've answered the phone, hey, this is how we're going to attack this guy. This, this, this is what the situation calls for. And we're going to go out there and attack that. So they all, while, as their heart is racing, as their mind is going, and they're trying to get ready quickly, hey, let's just focus on this. This is what we're going to do. This is how you're going to attack the hitter. Maximize their potential for that moment, that day. And we compete. And we see how, uh, at the end of the night, see how it, what the results are. And if Tanner Scott slider is working as well as it did in September, you're fine with that, analytics aside. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> okay. Adam, right over here. Uh, my name is Dave. I am a season ticket holder who came in with the Showalter era. Um, my question is to the pitching coach. The culture of the pitching staff, especially starting pitching, over the last 10 or 12 years has really been very chaotic. How do you plan on changing that and bringing some stability to how the starting pitching is um, is managed. And also, I have a real quick comment for Brandon. Um, I am a big Buck Showalter fan, and I was kind of predisposed not to like whoever replaced him, but I am now a Brandon Hyde fan. <laughs> Thank you. So chaotic in what form is as not not five guys that are on a regular rotation or you know and if that's it just give me a nod okay so here's the deal we have three pretty good top of the line guys we have Cashner we have Bundy and we have Cobb right so we have to get to spring training. We have to learn a lot of guys that I know nothing about right now. He knows nothing about. He knows nothing about. The nice thing for me is I have Johnny Watson here who's been in the organization that pretty much knows everybody. So when we find our five, maybe six guys, you know, I, I came from an organization where we used – Four guys and kind of mix two in. This guy go three, this guy go three, gives us six. We don't know what we've got yet. And for me, I would love to have five guys that step up, take the ball seven innings every day. It would make our job a lot easier. But at the end of the day, when we all sit in that room and we put our heads together, He's going to have questions. I'm still going to have questions. Johnny's going to have questions. And then some of us are going to have answers. We have to hope that those answers give us five guys. And right now, I mean, you know, I'm not planning on a sixth. I don't know exactly if he wants to go a four plus two, a four plus one, a five, a five plus one, maybe a carry guy. We don't, we don't know what we have yet. You know, we know we have youth. Is that youth going to give us problems as far as a guy that we have to be careful with innings-wise, that we, we, we don't want to run out of innings in August? Is, is that going to give us, you know, two guys that are going to have inning limitations? We don't know that yet. And the thing is, is, is when you get all of this information and we get to sit down in a room with the brass and ourselves, we're going to come up with, with something at the end of the day in those first five games when we have to rock and roll because, believe it or not, I was talking to Arnie about this. For pitching guys, I can't wait to get down there. I have a whole new staff. Johnny has a whole new staff. We're going down early. We're going to get the work in. At the end of the day, you go, man, it's time to get out of here. And then come opening the day, you go, oh, my God, are we ready? That's where we don't want to be. 
We want to be ready come opening day with five guys that we plan on giving us a ton of innings. And, you know, I, I promise this. Coming from other organizations, seeing everything, knowing that I'm coming into a group of guys that are going to put the work in and knowing what their beliefs are, we're not going to lack work. These guys are going to bust their hump every day, on the field, off the field. We're going to get ready. You, you can believe Vegas as a pitching coach. We don't believe Vegas. I, I, we've, we've got a whole new staff here. So who knows? I've seen weird things happen. I've seen teams that were supposed to, to win 50, win 80. My plan is one game at a time, win every out, win every inning, win every game. If it doesn't happen that way, we go back to the drawing board. You know, and, uh, when Mike was up here, he was talking about player development. And uh, at the sponsors event last night, it was really interesting watching Keegan Aiken and D.L. Hall and Dean Kramer mixing with the major leaguers and just following along and listening to them. And Keegan Aiken was the Eastern League Pitcher of the Year last year, and D.L. Hall probably was the best pitcher in the South Atlantic League. So I don't know how far they are away from Baltimore, but th there is some talent in the system. Well, there's a ton of talent and there's a ton of size. You know, <laughs> yes. not everybody can be a Marcus Stroman. And right. I get here, I, we, we get down to Sarasota, what, a week and a half ago? And I walked out and I go, oh, God, those are pitchers. <laughs> you know, I didn't have to say, okay, which guys are pitchers? You know, when you get out, when you get out on the field and you go, okay, which ones are the shortstops, which ones are the second? God, those are pitchers? I don't have that here. We don't, Johnny doesn't have that here. <laughs> so, you know, we've got, we've got size, we've got talent, we've, we've got a ton of talent. And that's, that's what we're going to build off of. We're going to make these guys as good as they can be and, and roll. Well, let's hear it for them, gentlemen. Thank you. This was very informative. Brandon Hyde, Artie Baylor, Doug Brokale, Tim Cousins, Don Long, John Wasden, and Howie Clark down there in the end. Welcome to Baltimore, guys. It's going to be a pleasure working with you this year. Let's hear it for them.